for this episode, I thought we would take you through the building of all these amazing teak decks. Uh, we'll go through and just explain sort of how it all started and all the different processes involved. Uh, bear in mind that this is over about a three month period, so we're going to be skipping through a lot of time here, but we'll try and keep it interesting and uh, show you how this amazing teak work uh, was done. Okay, here it is. First step onto the new boat. Dark, but there it is. When I first arrived on Dollinghoo, the vessel had been refit to a state where the teak decks were about to be laid. Basically, each of the big pieces of decking are made in the shop and then brought aboard to tweak it and make sure it all fits. Underneath of each of the slabs, epoxy filler is any of the small dancer holes in the, in the metal work is filled up. And then each piece is removed and a thick coat of epoxy is laid down uh, basically to fill all the gaps and to act as the glue that holds the teak down. Each of the slabs is then of course brought back aboard and very carefully without stepping in any of the glue each piece is fitted down into its respective place. The vacuum bagging process has then started. Basically a plastic bag is stuck down all the way around it and all the air is sucked out to provide an even pressure along all of the teak and all of the epoxy underneath of it so that any bubbles or any sort of gaps are sucked out of the epoxy. The green mesh material that you can see in the middle there, that's just sort of, as I said, mesh. And all that does is allow that all the air spaces can be sucked out at one time so there's no pockets that air gets trapped. That's all that's for. Then you can see what's going on here is there's a two-sided tape that sticks the plastic down to the metal and every single little inch of that two-sided tape is pressed down to make sure there's no leaks so that all of the air is, is being withdrawn. And the pump in the background that you can hear whining away, that's removing all the air. There were about 20 large slabs to be put down. Once those were in place, then the real work began, basically preparing all the edges and the fine trim areas to be teaked out with uh, all the margins. So the margin boards, as they're called, were then fit and trimmed in place. Each one done by hand, each one specifically cut for the location it was going. Just installing the margin boards, the outside boards here. All the nice rings around the plates. Here's the cockpit seating before it goes in. It's sitting on the docks. The cockpit flooring was one of the last things to go in because it obviously had to wait for the engine to be put in first, uh, which we'll talk about later. And it was laid in piece by piece. So it was pretty interesting to watch. Basically they did the same thing as before. They filled up a thick layer of epoxy underneath uh, where the cockpit would be going in. Each of the boards were then laid in place individually, all lined up so that they were symmetrical and looked good. The epoxy was then fared out between each of the each of the boards, uh, make sure that all it was even and everything was straight. They also cleaned up the margins while the epoxy was still wet in this case, as opposed to chipping it off later, which is what they did with the slabs. And then after this was done, basically it was caulked in place. So they, this was the first area of teak that had begun actually having the cecoflex, which is a type of caulking, put in and you can actually see what almost the finished product will look like. For the rest of the cockpit, before the slabs were put in place, they actually leveled and beveled the seats so that they are angled inward a little so that water will drain into the cockpit drains and you won't get a pool of water sitting on the seat, which is always helpful. One of the last projects to be built was the lazarette hatch. It's basically a big opening in the aft end of the boat that has a big hatch associated with it. It was built separately 
um, piece by piece as you can see individual slabs went in and then the margin boards were put all the way around and then basically the boat was built from one side to the other leaving the center piece uh, the last to be done the center piece is actually called the king plank um, the curvy bit of wood that's down the middle and it was the last one to go in because it was by far the most difficult and had to be handmade for each section. With all the major slabs in place and the vast majority of the margins being put down, sanding can begin on at least the big sections. And so for days and days, uh, a very fine grit sandpaper was used and all every square inch of the teak was uh, sanded with an orbital sander or by hand using a good old hand plane and some elbow grease and sandpaper. One of the most fascinating things for me generally during this process was just seeing how many people were aboard all the time working. At any given time there were at least 30 or 40 people on this boat working on various projects from inside to outside and the carpenters were just amazing they just created such cool stuff all the time just the decks are finally complete look beautiful so after a full three months of labor working on the decks every single day between 10 and 12 maybe 15 guys the decks were actually complete after a final washdown, there she was. Next time we'll get into how the derade vents were made, maybe some of the electrical, and then when we hauled the vessel out in an industrial shipyard. After a long hard day at the yard, the dusty yard, we come down to what's affectionately known as the banana bar. There, Mike. Well, we're in Asia, and in Asia, you don't always feel regular. So I kind of wanted some bread in my diet, just sort of for consistency's sake. So this is what you chose? This and these things are delicious. Oh, I love these things. I love them. And we are at the Caribbean. And because I'm going to drive in a minute, I have a choice of either driving and eating this or sitting here and eating it. So both for my stomach and for safety's sake, I need to eat this right now. While Michael spent his days in the shipyard, my task was to learn about the local cuisine. One day, while eating at our favorite restaurant, we got chatting with the owner, who invited me into the kitchen and offered to teach me how to cook some of our favorite Myanmar dishes. The techniques and ingredients that Pansy introduced to me are common from the Shan State region of Myanmar. She explained that many of the ingredients used in her restaurant are grown and shipped from a Shan State plantation owned and worked on by her parents. Pansy showed me how to make some of the dishes that we frequently ordered off the menu. These also happen to be Shan State dishes that she grew up eating. I was happy to learn that the ingredients used are common throughout Asia and the methods are easy to replicate. Carrots? Yeah, we put some carrots just for coloring. The dishes turned out great. Pork and long bean, and a tomato Shan State topping that went with three different dishes. And then Mike's favorite, spicy water spinach salad. So I'm in the galley right now. Been in here all day. I'm sweaty, it's a mess, and there's still so much more to be done. 
the boat is still, okay, so what's you know, that, uh, getting work done in the refit. Right that's why this insulation is there. That's why the ceiling is at a place in some areas. Um, so I'm in the middle of all that, trying to unpack. I've um, got <coughs> brand new appliances, which I've removed from the boxes. And I've tried to put away. There's our toaster, rice maker. I'm sure we'll get lots of action. And then here I've got my mixer. I can't wait to start baking. And a pancake griddle. And then that's my blender. And then trying to organize all these cupboards. There's my silverware still in the plastic. Provisioning a super yacht. Knives for late night watches. Open up now. Lasagna, juices for breakfast, all of the sauces that we need, rice. Just shopping during a regular power outage. The aisles look extra spooky during the power outage. As the boat's pantry was beginning at empty, it took many trips to the grocery store to fill it up. This particular trip, I had six people helping me, between unloading the cart, ringing me through, and then packing up the boxes of all the dry goods. Um, went grocery shopping yesterday for a lot of the dry goods. We still don't have a freezer or fridge yet so I couldn't get any fresh stuff um, but I got things like juice and a lot of snacks because I imagine waking up for 2 a.m. watch shift people are gonna want chocolate and something to keep them awake and snack on. So I'm trying to organize the cupboards as I like it you know like cooking supplies in one here um, that's all breakfast up there teas and coffees things that I'm gonna grab cooking, peanuts, uh, oats, all kinds of different sauces, juices, there's my knife. They're in the midst here of putting together the navs, nav station and all the equipment involved with that, making sure it's connected properly to both the wheel and the electrical panel. And then I'm hoping to be able to put all this shopping away, you know, the juice and the crackers and extra cans, but they're still working on my pantry. As you can see, there's Dominique, fitting into all of the small holes on the boat. This is maybe my fourth trip to the grocery store. And every time it's dry goods, but every delay in the refit, we go through another week of eating the food that I buy. So here we are. These are new, new to the boat though. Mike found these. Juice with chunks in it. This is good. I love them. So I'm just here at the local duty. No video? So just here provisioning um, the alcohol at a duty free store. Um, I was filming and got told to turn around because the wine was behind me. And uh, they're actually not allowed to sell import wine, um, which is clearly on the shelves. But anyway, so this is part of it. Um, we got boxes full of wine and liquors and it'll all be uh, coming back with me in the taxi to put on the boat, fill up the bilge. Luke, I am your father. How's my Darth Vader voice? <laughs> How's the puppy doing? Little girl, button sized box. Heaps of activity going on today. Um, we got the liquor order that's got to go into the bilge, perhaps add some weight to the, to the forward sales, everything from vases to vacuum heads to toilet bowl cleaners and Darth Vader masks in case you need to do some welding out at sea. This is the best kind of provisioning. Turning empty boxes, filling them into this, and unpacking. They're oh working God. on the aircon today so it is really hot down here on the boat. The sun is shining and it's just like a sauna in here. My job today is bottling up all these. Well, not bottling them, but wrapping them in bubble wrap. So at least that's some kind of a stress relief. As you can see, 
laundry day needs to happen really soon. shelves here um, there I happened to mention this morning you know it'd be nice if we could have like some way of storing the alcohol in that cupboard within five minutes he had drawn me a template and I have uh, a way to store bottles in there it's just gonna be circles and you stick the bottle in um, but everything else has to go in the bilge so we had kayaks delivered that were covered in bubble wrap so I cut that up into individual sizes wrapping them and then they go um, in the bilge because you can't have cardboard on the boat or paper because cockroaches tend to lay their eggs in the glue. So these flat cardboards are just holding them in now but they'll go in uh, individually in the bilge. And then they're uh, reusable too. You just take the bottle out, drink it, and then put another one back in. Perfect. Next time on Mount Ocean. With my fridge and freezer up and running, I'm able to do some of the fresh food provisioning. We give you an update on Button. We continue with more refit videos, and we get to take the boat out for the first time. There we go, pulling off the stern.